everybody. My name is Roger Berkowitz. It's nice to have you all here uh, at our lunchtime talk with Jennifer Lupu. Um, Jennifer is a, 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 a fellow here at the Hannah Arendt Center this, this year, right? Mm -hmm. It's been great to have you here. Now that we're not under mask things, it's nice to actually start seeing you at events. I mean, it's nice. Uh, it's been really great. So I appreciate your being here, and uh, it's been really wonderful having you here for last semester and this one. Um, Jennifer is a PhD candidate in anthropology at Northwestern University. She's a former postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History and the former archaeology intern for the Washington, D.C. Historic Preservation Office. Her talk, as you can see, is called Consuming Care, Pharmaceuticals Access, Environmental Racism, and the Governmental Regulation of Medicine in Washington, D.C., 1880-1920. I think Jennifer's going to speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a little time for a Q&A and enjoy your lunch. And thank you, Jennifer. Enjoy. Well, Thanks so much for that introduction, and it's been uh, absolutely great being here this year. Um, so I'll uh, jump right in. So I'm an archaeologist, um, and my field is anthropology. Um, and today I'm going to talk about um, medicine and healthcare access in Washington, D.C. between 1880 and 1920. But before I do that, I'm actually going to start in the present. Um, there are some troubling figures that have come out in the last few years and even before that about the state of healthcare in America today. Uh, the U.S. spends more per capita on healthcare than any other developed nation, but we rank the lowest in many measures of health outcomes, including average life expectancy. And here you can see our spending compared to other countries, including Switzerland, Germany, France, Canada. Um, we're right up here. And then it's a sort of faint line down here, but this light blue is our life expectancy, which is significantly lower than these other nations. Um, and it's even going downward a little bit since 2010. In addition, across numerous measures of health, there are marked racial disparities and gender disparities as well. These disparities exist even after controlling for factors such as income level and access to insurance. Um, and these have startled experts by getting continually worse and becoming even more pronounced in the last few years during the pandemic. But despite this, biologists and geneticists have found that these disparities don't have roots in genetic differences or biological causes. Rather, categories around race and gender are created and enacted socially, and they have biological repercussions that come about, about through repeated exposure to discrimination, inadequate medical treatment, restricted labor opportunities, segregated housing and other factors leading to what Clarence Gravely, a biological anthropologist, describes as, quote, a growing body of evidence that establishes the primacy of social inequalities in the origin and persistence of racial health disparities. Racial and other social categories are inextricable from social power relations and are enacted in historically specific ways. In a recent book, Racecraft, The Soul of Inequality in American Life, Co-authors Karen Fields, a sociologist, and Barbara Fields, a historian, write that, quote, from very early on, Americans wove racist concepts into a public language about inequality that made black the virtual equivalent of poor and lower class, thus creating a distinctive idiom in the U.S. that has no parallel in other Western democracies, end quote. And bioanthropologist Rachel Watkins writes that, our understanding of race as a social construct must consider the sustained role that biology plays in making race appear to be real. The present day COVID-19 pandemic highlights the importance of studying household medical care in America. Regardless of technological advancements, public health relies on individual and household practices of hygiene, illness treatment, and bodily care. Pandemics can highlight the structural inequalities and failings in our medical and social systems. Um, and so my project seeks to better understand the historical roots and manifestations of these pronounced disparities and structural inequalities in American healthcare systems. Here you can see information from the COVID Racial Data Tracker, an initiative that was partially organized by the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research, which explains that, quote, 
COVID-19 is affecting Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color the most. And nationwide, uh, this was uh, in 2021 when I got the statistic, Black people were dying at a rate of 1.4 times the rate of white people. So we can look at patterns of segregation in relation to drugstores in 1910, for example, or in relation to COVID testing sites in 2020. And these highlight the ways that disease and medical care is not apolitical. Rather, it's an essential site for studying social inequalities and their effects. And the point here is that we often see disease as natural, uncontrollable, and separate from human institutions and endeavors. The study of disease in the natural sciences is very common, and it illustrates this. However, when we look at disease transmission, we can see that it follows the pathways of social inequalities in our society, and that's why I take a social science and historical interdisciplinary approach. So in this talk, I'm first going to answer the question that might be on your mind, why would an archaeologist be studying medicine and, and uh, disease? Uh, and I'll give some historical context. Then I'll discuss my uh, approach, which is multi-scalar and focuses on everyday life and uses geographic um, technologies. I'll address Washington, D.C. as a case study and why I chose it. Um, then we'll look at pharmaceuticals as commodities, marketing practices, access, and two household case studies from Washington, D.C. So why archaeology? This is a picture of me on an archaeological day <laughs> <laughs> back when I was uh, doing more field work. Um, so archaeology provides an, a uniquely useful set of methodologies for studying disease and healthcare um, around household practices. While history as a field often looks at large-scale changes, archaeology can provide insights on how those changes manifest in daily life. Archaeology is also a powerful tool for understanding the lives of those not recorded or minimally recorded in documentary records. And in Washington, D.C. and other American cities, centralized trash collection didn't become common until after the start of the 20th century. Before this, people would often dig a hole in their backyard to fill with trash, throw trash into a backyard privy or an unused well. And because of this, a single trash deposit can be used uh, to link to a census record of a, a particular household to understand who was throwing away these uh, items. And caring for one's body is a, uh, for one's physical body is an essential daily life activity, incorporating a range of tasks from daily hygiene habits such as teeth brushing to accessing and ingesting pharmaceuticals to caring for ill or disabled selves or family members. And we can access this archaeologically through the material rain, remains associated with these everyday activities. Pharmaceutical bottles in particular are very are ubiquitous on late 19th to early 20th century archaeological sites, um, but they're very much understudied archaeologically. Medical historians have pointed to the turn of the 20th century as a crucial moment in American healthcare. It's amidst debates that led to the beginning of the governmental regulation of medicine. Many of the ins medical institutions that today shape America's healthcare landscape were beginning to take shape at this time. These include the Food and, Food and Drug Administration, the American Medical Association, which at that time was white only, and the role of the Surgeon General. And then this is uh, the first journal from 1909 of the National Medical Association, was cre which was created by a group of black doctors. Um, seeking to, and it was open to people of all races um, in response to the AMA being um, exclusively white. At this time, there's also um, starting to be new worker regulations and safety and sanitation laws. Germ theory is developing, um, and we're starting to learn about asymptomatic carriers. Uh, and the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act regulates advertising and eventually lays the foundation for the creation of the S FDA. It's also a moment of increased segregation in cities at the height of Jim Crow laws in the South and similar sets of segregation, segregationist practices and policies in the North. Um, there's a restructuring of racial categories and social regulations, which are becoming nationally institutionalized uh, through court decisions such as Plessy versus Ferguson, which was in 1896. Um, and so our, with archaeology, we can see how these large-scale changes were experienced at the household and city scales. 
Sorry, these are out of order. Um, so in Between Past and Future, Hannah Arendt writes, um, what is difficult for us to realize is that the great deeds and works of which mortals are capable and which become the topic of historical narrative are not seen as parts of either an encompassing whole or a process. On the contrary, the stress is always on single instances and single gestures and these exceptional moments. Um, so what I'm trying to do in this project is to, con uh, to contextualize these big changes um, through a broader understanding of their social context. And in doing so, I, um, I draw from a couple of different sources. Uh, medical anthropologists Osherson and Singham um, advocate for a perspective on the relationship between medicine and society as uh, dialectical, wherein, quote, the growth of modern medicine is viewed not as autonomous, but as an evolving institution with a changing culture, with its own functions and interests, but responsive to and productive of the ideas and stresses and interests of the larger society. Differing, differentiating between prescribed use and individual practice, anthropologists have conceptualized, uh, have complicated conceptualizations of medical knowledge as monolithic and unidirectional, uni advocating for patient-centered um, narratives. Um, I incorporate Bourdieu's insights and practice theory um, to explore the intersection of social prescription and daily life practice, drawing together Bourdieu's discussions of social reproduction with Desartos' emphasis on the per perspective of the consumer of spaces or goods. Uh, Des Desartos' practice theory centers on use rather than social prescription manifested not through its own products, but through its ways of using the products imposed by a dominant economic order. And when we, uh, in archaeology, we often talk about top-down versus bottom-up um, approaches or perspectives on social change. We can think of top-down as um, things that are instituted, instituted by a site of authority or governance. Um, for example, the food and sanitation laws that are put in place by the federal government um, and various different sites across the U.S., meat pl packing plants, etc., have to follow those uh, central rules or regulations. We can also see the way that change can happen through a bottom-up approach. Um, this is a sort of grassroots approach. I think a good example of this is um, with LGBTQ rights, which we've seen in our own lifetime. It seems that um, there was sort of a social, more of a social acceptance. People came out, there's more LGBTQ representation in media, and once that social acceptance had come about, then we have the governmental changes um, and the Supreme Court decisions that allow for gay marriage and these sorts of things. Um, but in many cases, there's a mix between bottom-up and top-down pressures, like we can see with the civil rights movement um, and, and movements for racial, for racial justice. We can look at abolitionist writings um, and from former slaves and white abolitionists and un-Europeans. Um, we can look at Rosa Parks as sort of these bottom-up pressures, um, but then anti-discrimination laws, voting rights and bringing in the National Guard to enforce school integration as top-down. Um, so there's a mix. And these rely on concepts which Ferguson and Gupta describe as verticality and encompassment, which are two conventional approaches to visualizing power spatially. Um, through these practices of spatial representation, uh, states and state actors work to legitimize and naturalize their authority through representing themselves as above and encompassing of other institutions and authorities. Um, so verticality is the sort of idea that the state is above other civil um, parts, of, parts of society, above the community, above the family. And then it, encompassment is a sort of like this series of larger circles where you have all these households and then they're encompassed by neighborhoods and then they're encompassed by cities and um, state or local governments and then the nation state. And um, these are su often suggested in our everyday language around governance. 
Um, but in reality, every lawmaker is a member of their own household, and uh, doctors as well. They're members of society, they're members of a neighborhood of a household, and in many ways they're no different from members of any other household. Um, and so when you start to think about these in detail, they sort of collapse in on themselves. Um, but so using tools of cartography and spatial analysis, I'm going to take a multi-scalar approach to examining the circulation and use of medical commodities at the city scale and the household scale. DC is an interesting and important case study. Uh, for much of its history, it was under congressional control, and lawmakers throughout history would sometimes refer to DC as the nation's laboratory, where policies could be tested out before being enacted nationally. Some examples of this include the Compensated Emancipation Act, which emancipated enslaved people in Washington, DC, a year or two prior to national emancipation. Prohibition was also passed earlier in DC, being passed in 1917. Um, and DC is also the backyard of the newly developed National Health Service. So as they're putting in uh, water filtration and other sanitation measures, they're seeing how it plays out in DC. And then lawmakers are using that information to decide national policies. And here on this slide, you can see an 1852 illustration of the city of Washington drawn by E. Sash and Company. This bird's eye view looks west over the Capitol down Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, in the middle, you see a waterway, this water right here, which might strike you as odd or unusual because it's not in D.C. anymore, but it was there. Um, and unlike other cities, such as New York and or New Orleans, which were seen as centers of vice, Washington, was, uh, as the nation's capital, was intended to be a model for the nation. And this is reflected in its cityscape. From its earliest plans, created by Pierre Charles L'Enfant, the cityscape was an ode to American capitalism and democracy. Using French theories of design, Washington has broad avenues that jut out like spokes on a wheel, centering on the capital, which rests on a tall man-made hill with incredible visibility over the city. And that is to sort of have these centers of governance uh, high up and visual across the city. Um, through the center of the city was a canal, which was intended to represent capitalist ideals of trade, circulation, and industry. But the canal ends up being, in many ways, um, a metaphor for this, the failings and the inequalities in, our, uh, in the way capitalism uh, has played out in America. Uh, due to, in part, inadequate funding, the surrounding society, and the conditions of urban life. With no centralized sewage or trash collection, the canal became polluted and mosquito infested, spreading diseases such as malaria, cholera, and yellow fever. As a result, the surrounding areas on the footsteps of the Capitol and the White House became neighborhoods of slums, brothels, and gambling saloons. These areas became known as Murder Bay, the Hooker's Division, and the Island, which was an impoverished area of the city cut off from the rest by the squalid canal. Undesirable to the city's wealthier and more privileged residents, this, this area became home to DC's poorer residents, and due to segregationist practices and housing and income inequalities, these were often black neighborhoods. As the close of the 19th century neared, the city's centennial celebration was coming about, and there were social pressures to make Washington the ideal site of the federal government, the ideal city that it was intended to be. Um, the canal was an eyesore and it was disease infested, so most of the canal was covered over in the late 19th century. However, the James Creek portion, which ran through southwest Washington, a historically black area, remained open and it continued to get progressively more squalid. Here are some newspaper articles and an archival photo of the canal. Um, the photo of the canal is from 1858 as the capital is being built. Uh, one article from 1868 describes the canal as three miles of liquid death. A later article from 1895 discusses the remaining portion that hadn't been covered over by this point in Southwest. Uh, saying in the article that it was not surprising or difficult to discern why the typhoid rates in that part of the city are disproportionately high. In the article, the author describes the awful conditions of the canal, saying that sewage is dumped in and, quote, this enormous body of filth flows 
or rather drifts through the southwestern section of the city, infecting more than a mile of the city with its deadly odors and thickened waters continually boiling from the bottom of this death trap. And while they've endured this for years, the article explains, quote, the horrible stench and sickly odors increase in the sewer as the city grows. And so we see here one example of environmental racism in Washington's history, and we can also see how healthcare inequalities are inscribed into the physical infrastructure of the city, and how the idealized uh, model of the city doesn't account for the reality of urban life and urban growth. Um, it wasn't until the early 1900s that sewage systems, trash collection, and water filtration were implemented across the city, and even then, uh, clean and safe water access was not universal. Um, but at the same time, by 1900, Washington, D.C. had the largest percentage of African American residents of any city, many brought by the promise of jobs in the federal government. And it was also a place where reformers, politicians, local activists, and everyday people were interacting and living their lives. And all of this sh helped shape the future of the nation. <clears throat> so I consider the pharmaceutical as a commodity. And I'm going to go into what this means. <coughs> Excuse me. Archaeological analyses of medical commodities provide insights into broader social phenomena, as healthcare is a key site for the establishment and negotiation of social re relations, where inequality and resistance can both be observed. Studying the historical development of pharmaceutical branding, together with a household analysis, brings a particular focus on the interaction between capitalism and medicine in American society. Uh, Paderai writes that in order to, quote, illuminate the concrete historical circulation of things, we have to follow the things themselves for their meanings are inscribed in their forms, their uses, and their trajectories. <clears throat> the turn of the century period is a really interesting moment. The pharmaceutical industry is booming and there's minimal regulation, so it's sometimes people call it the wild west of medicine. Um, there's all sorts of snake oils and magical cures that are supposed to um, fix everything. Um, and it's also a moment um, where, especially due to developments in printing and glass bottle manufacture, medicine companies are first beginning to develop extensive brand identities with cohesive symbolism that extends from advertisements to product packaging to the products themselves. Um, some products and brands that are still popular today can be found during this era, such as this glass Bayer aspirin bottle, which has the crisscross Bayer logo that you still see on Bayer aspirin bottles today. And you can see the sort of variety of different colors, shapes. This is just a small example because it's from uh, one site in Washington. Um, there's all these advances in bottle technology, so you can have more colors, more shapes, and more customized uh, items with, with their own logos. Wait, is this Bayer a German company? Um, or is that from Germany? Or is that in the US? No, this was found in Washington, D.C. It's from around 1920. Um, so a lot of the medical companies that are big today, wherever they, I don't know where they're based or originated necessarily, but a lot of them gained a lot of income through especially the Civil War and World War I, um, providing medications to um, the American military. Um, and um, yeah, a lot of the brands that we still see today are, are existing. And this, this is, for example, Pond's Cold Cream, um, which is still in use today. And there are some others as well. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Um, okay, so this is an interesting recent study and it shows the importance of branding in pharmaceuticals, especially in terms of pain relief. Pain relief is something that is somewhat subjective and though um, we sort of have an understanding that humans do experience pain. Pain is a symptom for various causes. We don't have a visual or measurable way um, to document this. 
Um, this is a particular study where, which was done recently, where four groups of patients who were experiencing headache pain um, were, were, they were divided into four groups. Two of them received actual aspirin. Two of them received basically placebos, medicines that would not do anything, um, or pills like sugar pills. But of each of these, one, uh, one of each group was told that they were receiving a branded version and the other group was told that they were receiving a generic version. And regardless of whether they actually received aspirin or they actually received a placebo, those who were told they were receiving a branded product experienced a greater reduction in their pain symptoms. Like they rated their pain on a scale of one to 10, then they took these pills, and then at like half an hour later they rated it again. Um, and in both cases, whether they received aspirin or whether they received placebos, the branding made a difference in how they experienced this. Um, so a medical anthropologist talked about this as a meaning response, where um, it, scientists have studied the idea that if you mentally prepare to expect a change in your pain levels, you will actually feel it. Um, and you will experience it. And so over time, a repeated belief in a branded substance's effectiveness begins to repeat and reinforce a consumer's actual bodily response to the product. Um, so with each act of ingestion or use, consumers reinforce their association between a trustworthy product and an experience of pain remediation. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk in a second about how testimonials in advertisements are used to prepare patients to have this meaning response. Um, so the, um, in order to ex uh, analyze the full scope of material items, text, and trademarks that created a meaningful commodity, I apply the concept of multimodality defined by linguistic anthropologists Cameron and Panopic as, quote, the use of di different semiotic systems in a single text, which requires analysts to pay attention to the way that language interacts with, for instance, images, graphic devices, and music. Um, and the chart I've created here represents the social relationships, materials, and signification incorporated in each, into each product's multimodal assemblage. assemblage. This chart parses out the various elements of the advertisements and the artifacts, showing how these mediate the social relationships between the producer and the consumer. Um, trust between a consumer and a producer is therefore materialized in the trust for the product. There is, that is like the idea that the consumer is paying for a product that works and that will be effective. Um, that trust in the, in the producer of the medicine is materialized in a trust for the product. And testimonials were a key part of medicine ads from the turn of the century on, um, voicing the promises of the producer through the supposed voice of a fellow consumer. Um, and so these are going to be, I'm going to go through a couple of case studies of these. These are all advertisements from Washington, D.C., but they are um, med medical commodities that were sold nationwide. Uh, uh, and this is the topic of... Um, these case studies and the uh, multimodal approach to branded medicines is the topic of an article that I've written, which will be coming out this fall in the Historical uh, Archaeology Journal. Um, I, and in the article, I examine newspaper advertisement strategies for two products that were sold as pain relievers, McElroy's Wine of Cardui and Mexican Mustang Liniment. So McElroy's Wine of Cardui, which you see here, was marketed to women of all races and ethnicities, but their ads exclusively depicted wealthy, slim white women. Um, and the other I'm going to talk about is a product that marketed specifically toward an African American consumer group. And in both of these, the inclusion of testimonials is key. So wine of Cardui advertisements like those seen here draw attention to the concept of ideal womanhood tied to femininity, beauty, health, and attention to wifely duties. They, a lot of times throughout the ads, they'll say, like, are you not a beautiful, glowing woman? It is because of the weakness of your organs, and you need this uh, product to strengthen them. Um, the ads suggest to women that they have fallen short of these unreachable ideals of patriarchal whiteness simply because they are unwell. 
suggesting Cardui as a cure-all for misery and inadequacy. Uh, the ads sometimes chastise women for not attending to their own ailments well, or in stark contradiction, uh, for running to doctors with every ailment to no avail. Women in the advertisements uh, claim, complain of ailments such as a period that lasts for over four months with no stop and with extreme pain, to, to issues like general lethargy, um, to descriptions of what might be today diagnosed as like bacterial vaginosis or some sort of a, a discharge issue. Um, and in the testimonials, women often describe seeing multiple doctors without help before turning to the product and finding relief, as this indicates cures after doctors fail. Um, and in the article, I argue that due to a lot of issues with how gynecology is developing at this time and changes in medical practice, the idea that at this time a white male doctor would be touching the genitals of someone, it, it gets into these issues of privacy and morality and um, there's a lot of emphasis in these ads that these can be consumed in private. You can just go to the drugstore and buy them, no one has to know. And from, the in, from its introduction in 1879 until approximately 1920, the Cardui bottle was a tall, colorless, clear rectangular bottle with paneling around its body, affixed paper labels, and a brandy slash wine style finish. You can see the bottle here. Um, and it's also depicted in this ad. Um, and actually fully colorless glass, clear, transparent glass, is very difficult to produce. And um, during, so prior to the 20th century, most medicines came in aqua or cobalt blue bottles and less frequently in leaded glass, which was colorless but not fully clear. Um, so the bottle shape and finish are traditional for medicines. However, the clear colorless glass and panel decoration would evoke a sense of luxury for the consumer. Um, and while this product was affordable to many demographics, it was marketed to it was marketed with an elite luxury aesthetic through its, the bottle's design. Um, in terms of its content, it turns out this medicine was 20% ethyl alcohol and was sweetened with lead. Um, <laughs> it, it was, mind you, recommended for women who were pregnant, Hi. women who were uh, nursing, from uh, puberty through old age, for menopause, for anything related. If you were a woman and you had any problem, you should take this. Um, in addition to the toxic components, it also contained a small amount of blessed thistle and black haw, which were plant-based remedies um, that have uh, been used for, for a long time and continue to be used by midwives and homeopathic healers for a variety of menstruation-related issues. So while these herbs may have had some health benefits, the high alcohol content and the inclusion of a heavy dash of lead would have been very harmful, especially for pregnant women. The next product I look at is Mexican Mustang Liniment, um, which was a topical pain relief ointment sold by the Lion Manufacturing Company. Um, it also used testimonials, and it appears to be one of the first companies ever to market their products specifically to an African-American consumer base. Beginning in the 1850s, the topical medication was sold in major drugstores across the U.S. and was initially advertised in a range of mainstream newspapers from South Carolina to Alaska. But beginning in the 1890s, a series of Mexican Mustang liniments appeared in the Washington Bee, an African-American newspaper in Washington, um, and they included a racialized advertising scheme that marketed the product to black consumers. Um, and you can see here these um, the ads from the Washington Bee. Um, <clears throat> and I also want to mention that I did try to find out if any of the people in the testimonial who were supposedly named in the testimonials were real people. And it seems like they were mostly not. And the testimonials all follow a very sort of predictable format that suggests that they were written by copy editors. Um, but it sort of suggests to the consumer that a fellow consumer has found uh, treatment in this product. Um, and um, in my paper, I talk more about how there are disparities in pain treatment, especially for black patients at this time, 
who are often invalidated and under-prescribed pain medication due to racist bias in medical knowledge and practice. There are still to this day uh, people in medical school who believe that black patients experience less pain or pain different, their pain differently than white patients. Um, and again, we have like a very segregated city um, and there are no labor laws at this point, um, or very few. Um, so, uh, so I argue that these advertisers are trying to exploit this lack in uh, healthcare and these gaps. Um, so this, the contents of this medication are that it was uh, equal parts crude petroleum, olive oil, and carbonate of ammonia. And basically what that is, it's like baking soda and a sort of un, unregulated, unpasteurized um, or whatever form of Vaseline. So at worst it would be ineffective, um, but the petroleum or oil acts as a binder and slows down the ev evaporation of the salve and it would provide a sort of cooling, tingling sensation. Um, so it would provide sensations that could become associated with pain relief and it convinces the user that it was effective. Um, however, we now know that repeated exposure to petroleum oil can be, and especially this crude petroleum, could be dangerous and irritating to skin. Um, the, the advertisements for this product follow typical patent medicine marketing trademarks with lofty claims of miracle results from curing a woman of her seven year long headache to restoring function to injured limbs that had been lame for years. Um, it claimed to treat a wide variety of ailments, including all lameness, including movement impairments and paralysis, along with cuts, burns, scrapes, cough, and neuralgia. Um, each ad follows a strict formula with a headline asserting the curative properties of Mexican Mustang liniment for a particular ailment, an, an image of this supposed user, um, and these all these images are racialized as black, um, and then a testimonial about the user's ailment which aligns with the headline. Over the years it was packaged in a variety of small bottles, most of which were aqua in color, and all of which were around four inches in height. The aqua color had long been common for medicine bottles, and so along with its small size, the bottles perhaps suggested to the consumer that this product was an innocuous and typical medicinal product. Um, and so the small stature and simple form of the Mexican Mustang bottle, liniment bottle both seeks to calm the concerns of its consumers while minimizing their experiences of physical pain. Unlike the large wine of Carduy bottle, which suggested to consumers that their pain required massive amounts of medication, the Mexican Mustang liniment bottle essentially promises that a paralyzed leg can be fully healed with a teaspoon of its greasy mixture smeared across the skin. So now how are these accessed? Here I have a map of the census racial demographics of Washington DC and these dots rec represent drugstores in the city. Um, and I'm continuing to use city directories to map the locations of doctors, hospitals, and drugstores over a longer period of time to look at how it changes over time. Um, so, yes. Um, here is what's called a catchment analysis map. You might assume that you could easily determine what your nearest drugstore is, but this takes in um, like the slope and the um, landscape mm -hmm. and a preference for walking on existing streets to look at not which is the closest drugstore, but which is the most easily accessible from any point in the city. So each of these large colorful blobs represents the area for which one drugstore is the most accessible. And so you see this huge purple area they all, their most accessible drugstores right there, um, even though they're like, you'd think it might be here, but it's, it's not. Um, yeah, so for much of the city, you can kind of see clear patterns that it's located in, in the center of the city, and as segregation is increasing, black communities are more increasingly pushed toward the outskirts of the city where there are fewer resources. Um, but I'm going to look at two parts of the city, two neighborhoods in particular. This is called Anacostia, um, and it is a predominantly black neighborhood to this day. And this is Georgetown, which at the time was a racially mixed area 
um, but has been gentrified into a mostly white area, um, but at the time it was racially mixed. So my first case study looks at this house uh, on Stanton Road in Anacostia. Um, by the 1900s, this house was inhabited by Annie Taliaferro and her adult daughter, Olivia. Olivia was trained as a nurse and midwife. Um, and then there were also some other extended family members. You can read more about um, this site on this blog post here. Um, the DC Historic Preservation Office, um, before the standing structure was knocked down a few years ago, did um, a historical analysis and also archeological analysis on the site. Although they didn't find much in the trash deposits, they did find an attic which had a number of bottles that had been saved. Um, and here we see some of the bottles because they were saved in an attic. You can see that they still have their paper labels which often indicate the location where they were purchased. Um, here this one is from 1902. Um, and these medications um, were mostly for things related to midwifery. They were probably related to her practice. Um, she was a sort of community health provider. At this, um, um, I should mention that Annie and Olivia Taliaferro were African American, and at this time it was very difficult to be certified as a nurse as uh, an African American woman, but Olivia was successful in doing so. Um, so, <clears throat> I used the information from these bottles together with the city's directory's list of pharmacies to plot what's called the least cost path from the Stanton Roadhouse to the three pharmacies represented here. And you can see that here. So this is where Olivia uh, Talia Farrow lived and she purchased medicines from here, here, and here. All these black dots represent drugstores. So while you might think it would be simple to just go to your nearest drugstore, it's not actually the case. Different drugstores at this time carry different products. Um, and clearly Olivia had to go very far away to get certain items. Um, these might not represent Olivia's exact path. Perhaps she ran a side errand along the way or took a streetcar for part of the journey. However, they indicate the considerable distance that she covered in order to obtain these medications. This is the least taxing based on slope preference for taking streets um, and elevation. So you don't want to walk up a steep hill and you don't want to be walking like over hills. Um, and so there's still a considerable distance across the city. Um, in reality, different drugstores carry different products. In addition, pharmacists were known to sometimes have racist conceptualizations of black people's pain tolerances and were thus known to mix weaker formulas for black patients sometimes. So it's unclear why Olivia traveled so far. Perhaps she needed to travel farther to find the products that she needed. Perhaps she went further to have them filled by pharmacists she trusted. Maybe she sought out further stores where she could remain more anonymous. Some of these products might be able to be used as abortifications or uh, contraceptives. Um, but regardless, the map indicates that Olivia was traveling extremely far and enduring substantial bodily strain in order to access the medical products she needed for herself, her family, and her patients. And with each trip, her long journey ended with a steep, steep climb uphill to her home. And the red indicates a uh, steeper elevation or higher elevation, whereas green is lower. Um, uh, in DC, there's still only one hospital in Southeast and in the Anacostia area. Um, it's extremely overfunded, overextended and underfunded. Um, this has been a big um, policy um, argument of the movement for black lives in DC to fund this hospital. A new hospital is supposed to open in December of 2022, the end of this year. But in the meantime, many have died on a long trip to the hospital, trying to access a hospital with a trauma center. And these things are nationwide. Um, as you see here, Fauci talking about how the COVID pandemic and systemic racism form dual pandemics in, in the US. Um, and to conclude, I'm gonna to turn to a final case study. Uh, this is Halcyon House in Georgetown. It is a large mansion. It was one of the earliest structures built in Georgetown. In 1900, it was purchased by someone named Albert Adsett Clemens, who was rumored to have lived there alone with a male carpenter. Um, and 
uh, in the 80s, there was an archaeological excavation of this site, um, which was premature, prematurely, their excavation was prematurely uh, concluded because there was a dispute between the firm and the landowner. So all the artifacts that were found were put in boxes and had never been studied until 2017 when I started to work with this collection. Um, and yet, this site is the site where there is the most number of pharmaceutical bottles found on any single site in Washington, D.C. So why is the question? Why are there so many bottles in this deposit? And why are there dozens more than were found at any other single household site in the city? Here's a picture of the archaeology excavation from the 80s and where uh, an overview of like where the different excavation units were. Here's Halcyon House and access to all its nearest drug stores. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot more drug stores very close to the house, much more easily accessible than um, for Olivia, for example. Um, but even this doesn't explain why this house is such an outlier. Um, however, there are a lot of clues in a lot of different ways. So first, um, I want to point toward the, a little bit more of the context. Um, the late 19th century to early 20th century featured an escalation of scientific and medical attention to a variety of things, including racial difference, same-sex attraction, and gender nonconformity, and neurological variation. They were seeking biological origins and explanations for differences in behavior and appearance. And there were also very strong reform movements in Washington and across the country, including the Temperance Movement and the Prohibition Party. Um, these, in some cases, were uh, based in evangelical Christianity and an explicit concern for the morality of, quote, the sons and daughters of the white race. Um, these reformers pressured for the criminalization of prostitution and other behaviors seen as immoral along with the prohibition of alcohol. And in addition, these movements pressured for the regulation of the highly, uh, highly alcoholic patent medicines and other substances such as opiates. Um, in the early 20th century, the temperance movement and other reformers see, succeeded in passing morality forms that criminalized, quote, all such persons who lead a notoriously lewd or lascivious course of life, end quote. Um, and throughout the 19th and into the 20th century, however, um, laws and regulations against immoral sexual behavior were disproportionately enforced on black and poor individuals who are more likely to be arrested and charged for dressing or acting indecently in public. Whereas we have a lot of evidence that wealthy white people seen as men, such as Albert Clemens, were able to exist in their sort of queerness with a degree of openness. Um, and there are journals from this time that indicate that there are um, there's a large sort of gay community in Washington, D.C., and that they're semi-public. So um, during the 1910s, Albert and this carpenter built all sorts of additions to this house, including a backyard stage and a theater, which is, has a secret entrance that's disguised to look like uh, window panes from the outside. Queer spaces tended already to be somewhat secretive or underground, so they became a natural site for illicit alcohol consumption during Prohibition. And these spaces are well documented in other cities, such as New York, where drag balls were sometimes depicted in newspapers and even intended, uh, attended by wealthy members of prominent members of society. And it, as I said, in DC, Prohibition began in 1917, three years before it was passed nationwide. Um, and in the materials from the trash deposit, there are a vast variety of very elaborate um, corset and lingerie items and other items marketed exclusively to women, along with colorful lamp glass, fragments of handheld fans, um, and thick theater makeup. Um, here are some of the artifacts. This is a particularly interesting artifact. It took me a long time to figure out what this is. It is a, it's tiny, this is one centimeter, so it's very tiny. And these are actually um, these sort of anti-prohibition charms. They were shaped like beer steins and they would have sentences 
on them that were in favor of drinking culture, <laughs> like I won't be home till morning, or a camel can go a day without a drink, but that's no life. I don't know exactly what this one can say, but it's something similar to the camel one, because it said something can go blank a day, that's no something. Um, and so it's a really interesting pro, uh, pro drinking culture I item. This is also a a uh, whiskey bottle from the 1910s in Washington DC with traces of actual whiskey left in it and I would love to get it chemically tested so that I could have a modern day whiskey distillery try to reproduce this pre-prohibition era whiskey. I think that would be super cool. And then there's these other, um, these other items. So for the most part, um, there's sort of rumored to be parties at Halcyon House, but the details of them are not fully known. Um, and the theater with the secret entrance is supposedly never used, um, but it was filled with items and it appeared used. Um, so th there was, however, one event that was covered in several newspapers, an outdoor garden party in 1919. So this, the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918 um, was the first incidence of H1N1, a flu that we now have yearly and which we get a yearly flu vaccine for. Um, but it spread rampantly through the uh, through World War One. Uh, it's thought to have originated in the U.S. and then was brought over to Europe and spread through Europe. Interestingly, the reason it's called the Spanish influenza is because most nations uh, censored discussions of the epidemic because they didn't want the other side to know that their soldiers were falling ill. Uh, but Spanish newspapers were publicly writing about the epidemic, so it came to be known as the Spanish influenza, even though it was not in any way associated with Spain. Um, in any case, the, over the summer and fall of 1918, the flu appears on the front page of newspapers nearly every day. Um, sort of like with our COVID pandemic, for a while it was on the front page every single day, and now it's still there, but it's not um, the first article that you see. Um, and after three brutal waves of that pandemic, it, it had faded into discussions deeper into the newspaper, and by the spring of 1919, people were starting to begin to gather again a little tentatively. There was a benefit gala and masked performance advertised in newspapers to take place at Halcyon House, hosted by Albert Clemens. Although it was postponed several times to due, to rain, due to rain, it eventually came to fruition on a chilly evening, May evening in 1919, a team of volunteers and workers were adorning the extravagant gardens of Halcyon House with Japanese themed decor. Colorful lanterns hung throughout the terrace garden, dangling above the tangled bushes and pathways backed by an old Georgian mansion. The garden led down to an outdoor stage framed by a magnificent vista across the Potomac River and into the lights and forests of Virginia. After being twice postponed due to rain, dozens of guests gathered in this picturesque setting for a benefit party and a performance of The Sun Goddess, a Japanese-inspired mask. Quote, it was a glorious party and everyone was reluctant to leave, lauded a journalist in attendance. The guest list was odd and eclectic. A prominent Japanese statesman, a Venezuelan diplomat and his sister, a cast of theater actors from across the city, and a bunch of so-called society women, um, photographs and accounts from the event tell of society girls dressed in kimonos and imported fabrics, but none of them describe Albert Clemens that night. Um, and here's a full page. This is like buried way deep in the Sunday edition of the Evening Star. Um, but you can tell a little bit if you look closely that it looks like some people are wearing gender nonconforming dress and that there's a little bit of um, sort of wordplay in their names, the way that present day drag queens sometimes incorporate things like fishy or fish um, as like a metaphor for vaginal. Um, and in any case, we don't have any account of where Albert was, so perhaps Albert slipped in and out of the crowd, unrecognized as anyone other than an anonymous woman in an elaborate costume. Um, and um, that story concludes my talk. Thank you all for attending, um, and I'm eager to hear uh, any questions or thoughts that you may have? Thank you. All right, so it's about 2.30. I'm sorry, I went a little long. No, it's all right. Um, maybe you have a couple questions, if there are have some questions or comments or things that people have.
and uh, go on. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of fascinating stories. I'll start with one. Just so you you talked about the the one woman who was a midwife. Yeah. I'm just. I mean. You didn't mention the fact that she may not have clients all over the city. Would she have had clients primarily in the one area she's in, or would she have been going around the city to see different clients and maybe picked up medicines at different places where her clients were? Or that's thing we can even know or not. Um, that's definitely a possibility. Um, I, they, there are no written records of her practice, so it's hard to tell who her patients were. Um, but she would have certainly had a large number of patients nearby her who didn't have access to any other medical care or had very little access to, to care other than her. But like I said, she was one of the only uh, trained and qualified black midwives in the city and, and um, she was trained as a nurse as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it is definitely possible that she was traveling to um, accommodate a very high patient load. Um, and interestingly, um, experts today have pointed toward the, la the, um, the fact that in the U.S. we have fewer midwives, and, as well as fewer OBGYNs, but especially fewer midwives as compared to European contexts, and point to this as a possible reason for our uh, large issues with maternal, oh, sorry. with maternal mortality rates, which are seen to be a preventable disease. So just, uh, just as a question about your project, to the extent, you talked about consumer care, right? That mm -hmm. was the title. Is there a reason you focus on a midwife, not a, I mean, not a house where there would just be like what we call a consumer? I mean, yeah, um, yeah. So um, the sort of idea, of the title of consuming care, it's a, uh, it's sort of meant to be a double, and on top of it in a way, like a, you know, consuming medicines. Uh, they could sort of capitalist system of, of um, paying for meta medical products and medicines and medical services. Um, now, many of the products that are found at um, the Talia Farrow house are um, likely, some of them were used by the family, as well as some being used by, in her practice. Um, I am working on expanding this, and I'm, this is the research that I'm, the chapter that I'm working on right now. I'm looking at over 40 households across the city to do statistical analysis of um, the percentage of blasts in various trash deposits and seeing how these play out across a variety of households. Um, the reason I use Olivia Taliaferro in this talk is because there's this really unusual case of having the labels affixed to the medicines. Um, so I was able to do that mapping exercise. So um, the sort of travel through the city to access medicines is a, a part of the dissertation that I'm looking into. And so yeah, I do hope to um, contextualize it in a broader array of um, contexts. These are just two of the ones that, I've been, they're both sort of outliers, but they're, they're two of the ones that I've um, worked through a little bit more. Yeah. Um, thank you for this uh, excavation also in your, <laughs> in your presentation. I really enjoyed how you went from like a, a general view or an overview like more and more into uh, sort of the depth and the particulars of, of, of your research. And um, maybe in part you answered my question or uh, what you just said about the mapping as a as a connecting tissue in terms of your presentation of the mm -hmm. like general view uh, um, level and the particular level level. Um, but um, maybe you could uh, uh, have a little bit more elaborate on the way in which you uh, negotiate these two different insights, maybe or intrigues you have to see how various neighborhoods or how, how the, these particular houses are, do you regard them then as sort of a repre representatives of a general uh, development or a general state at a certain time in 1920, 19, you know, 1910? Or do you um, say methodologically, as it were, go f at a certain point into individual stories so that you jump off, let's say, from a certain medical finding or, or pharmaceutical finding into uh, 
telling a story about uh, sexuality, for example, or about uh, mm -hmm. about race relations. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, that. Thank you for putting it that way. Because ideally, in the larger dissertation, what I will do is look at sort of quantitative data, statistics across the city, and then also complicate these by case studies. And sh um, like one of the things I talk about in my um, in my dissertation is what is a household. We think of a household as a, a nuclear family a lot of the time. But actually, in historic Washington, in historic the US, there was no one typical household. There were multifamily households. There were single families who had borders, single families who did or didn't have servants. There were brothels, boarding houses, institutions. There were queer romantic couples. There were all sorts of different ways that people lived together and met their daily life needs. And so I consider a household to be people who are co-resident and who are working together to meet their needs and disposing of their trash together. Um, and so um, in the larger dissertation, I'm looking at case studies of, for example, brothels. Um, and there's an interesting sort of theory that um, households where there are a lot of women should have more digestive medications because corsets are known to cause a lot of digestive issues. And so I want to see if that plays out in practice and if these more like female dominated households like brothels and boarding houses, um, women's boarding houses tend to have more digestives and other contexts or stuff like that. So um, yeah, the idea is that it's sort of is a little bit of a thinking through social science and um, the ways that you know you can take a quantitative study of public health or other things. Um, but that, that doesn't really get you the full picture. You need these qualitative case studies as well. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully by looking at these different scales and bringing them together and also bringing in like medical uh, statistics from the 1900s of different diseases and death rates, um, it can provide a broader picture of these sort of changes, you know, as these lawmakers are watching what's going on around them and they're passing these laws how that's playing out on the household level mm -hmm. um, and across the city and how that you know regardless of their efforts to confront these inequalities in medicine um, there's still issues with access and stuff like that and, and um, those have endured into mm -hmm. the present Thank you. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this has brought up so many interesting avenues for me, and I, I really appreciated your framing of it from, yeah, just kind of like why the discipline of archaeology, which, you know, I grew up watching Raiders of the Lost Ark, and archaeology, or it's like Ben Franklin's house with teaspoons, right? And so the idea that archaeology, that the household can be any household that gets sort of excavated or gets reconstituted or understood in this way is really interesting to me. And then... Um, I feel like it has this really interesting connection, yeah, just as waste, as just this fascinating bridge between the private and the public, and, um, you know, it has so much resonance with issues of like, recycling. Like, I'm just thinking about my ibuprofen bottles right now, <laughs> you know, like, where do they go? And so yeah. this just uh, made me conscious of just this trace of, um, and our ideas of care. Yeah, as uh, as being contained in the household, but then kind of being informed from the outside, being a habit of consumption, and then but then also, like it is like disposing of things that we consume medically is is not always easy. Yeah, uh, and that they do persist in certain ways. So I I, yeah. I just and I was also thinking about like the, how they started tracking COVID through the sewers. Mm. So just this, it raised a lot of interesting questions for me about like the idea of the household and then this like boundary between the private and the public that med medicine in particular really yeah. like bridges. And then I specifically I had a question about um, the Halcyon house. I mean, it had that Im immense store of bottles. Were there medical bottles in there or was it mostly alcohol? 
Um, so there's a couple of interesting ways I want to I want to take this question. One, um, the differentiation between medicine and alcohol at the time <laughs> yeah. is a little more fluid, right? Because like whiskey, for example, is often used medicinally. For example, there are a lot of whiskey bottles at the Stanton Ruin House. Um, where, with Olivia Taliaferro, okay. um, because like before anesthesi like before you know anesthesia or stuff like that, um, you know you might like have a napkin soaked for like a baby in whiskey, right. or you might give it to a patient if you have to do like procedure, um, and then also medicines are often highly alcoholic. So um, this line between medicine and alcohol is a little bit divided. Prohibition. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. and and um, these reformers are against alcohol, but they're also against these medicines that are very okay. alcoholic. Um, and so there are these, but obviously you can't get rid of all alcohol in medicine because it's often used as a like a vessel for whatever else. Um, whatever other substances, it's a way to make a, med a liquid medication. Um, but yeah, so the, that's a little bit elided. Um, there are medicine bottles at Halcyon. Um, there also, and I didn't have time to go into this in this talk, but there was during the Civil War, so the Halcyon collection ex extends um, from, from 1800 until 1920s. Um, most of the artifacts are from the 1900s to 1920s period, but there was a very wealthy drug manufacturer named John Lawrence Kidwell, who was the eighth head of the American Pharmaceutical Association. He was known as the Quinine King during the Civil War because he provided quinine to the Union Army, but I also found evidence um, through some newspaper sources that he may also have been involved in smuggling quinine to the Confederacy, so he was sort of a war profiteer, profiting on both sides. Um, and apparently when he got older, he had an accident and became paralyzed and became addicted to opiates, which were one of the medications that he had been distributing. And so there are a lot of those bottles as well. Mm -hmm. um, and Halcyon, and my research does, like, my, my, I'm hoping to, like, you know, build a career off of all this stuff. I don't have time for all of it in one sure, dissertation. Of course, yeah. Um, but, yeah, there are a lot of, there are medicine and alcohol bottles at Halcyon, and, um, you know, there's also, like, food extract bottles, which have a high alcohol content, which were sometimes gotten during Prohibition as, like, if you couldn't get other alcohol, you could get, like, like vanilla extract that was alcohol based and drink that. The owners of that house were white, correct? Yes. Okay, and they were in the Georgetown location. Yes, Albert, Albert was white, he lived in Georgetown. Um, he did at one point get married to a woman, but she was living in another house across town with a woman who's listed in the census as her companion. They got married in their 40s. Uh, it seems like right after her mother died and perhaps she needed to be legally married in order to get her inheritance. Um, so there's all these interesting dynamics and then Albert Clemens like collected some works by gay playwrights. There's all this, there's all these various little pieces of evidence and I, I have a whole separate talk about like queer history and the Halcyon House. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a, norm, a number of interesting elements to that house and um, the archaeologists, I did an oral history with one of the archaeologists who worked on the site in the 1980s and she recalled digging through and finding more glass than dirt in some, like it looked like a lawn and you dig into it and it would just be bottles and bottles and bottles and there were just tremendous numbers of whole bottles um, at this site so it's a really interesting, like that's part of why I chose it as a dissertation research sure. site because there's so many pharmaceutical bottles but it's also definitely an outlier. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jen. Thanks. Thanks.